Um, if you are just uh, trying to use formulas from the textbook, these questions are not easy to do. I mean, it's not impossible to do, as in you can find the right algebraic steps to do it. But without the tools I'm introducing in that note, it becomes very hard to do. So uh, this is the setup. Uh, let me call it collider configuration. And in the example, I'm using numbers, but let me just do it algebraically without any numbers. So uh, let's say you have two particles, two, two particles of the same mass that you are making them collide. So two particles of mass M that are coming towards each other that's colliding. And as they collide, let's say you are creating a single particle of some big mass M. Okay? And uh, you are given the energy of the beam. Let's say the particles in this beam have energy E1. And actually, particle in this beam has the same energy, E1. Good. And the question, um, so this is the part B of that example too. The question would be, um, so let me renumber here, A. Uh, what is mass of the single particle mass big M? This one, if you have the right intuition, you might be able to answer really quickly without writing down a bunch of formulas. Like, what should be this mass be? No answer. Well, let's write it down. All right, all right, all right. So if, if you had the intuition to write it down, great. If not, let's just go through the steps. So what principle are we using here? Where do we start? Conservation. Yeah, conservation of energy and momentum. So let's just write down the conservation of energy and momentum expression. So energy is conserved. Um, I'm told that I have E1 and E1 here. So energy conservation says that E1 plus E1, or two E1s, is equal to, uh, what's the expression for energy after collision? Yeah, just the rest energy of this single particle. Could this particle be moving? There's something that prevents this particle from moving at all. Conservation of momentum. Yeah, conservation of momentum. So Gaoja, what tells you that net momentum here, what tells you that net momentum here is equal to zero? Equal energy, meaning equal magnitude of momentum. And they are going in the opposite direction, so they, the momentum should add up to zero. So, so now here's one useful fact to know. Wait, useful fact? I don't know. Here you can kind of figure out, OK, you have net momentum equal to zero, single particle, its velocity is zero. Right? OK, none of this is surprising to people. OK, so uh, energy conservation, so you just have the rest energy mc squared here. And I guess we could write that moment in conservation, but kind of don't need right now. So, um, so it's looking for mass. So mass here would simply be 2e1 divided by c squared. That's kind of it. Simple. Right? So, um, so this is what I was uh, referring to as the center of a momentum reference frame, where your net momentum is zero, and especially if you have a single particle in the reference frame, things are super simple. Because, well, you just add the rest energy and that's it, E equals mc squared. No gammas or nothing to worry about. Okay? So now what I want to have about 20 minutes or so to go through is the more interesting situation where you are no longer in the center of mass frame, but um, uh, this single particle may be moving. So, I think this is one situation where it's kind of more useful for me to give some numbers. So let's say um, we want to arrange this in such a way. So for this is for part B. This is how I want to arrange it. So let's say these energy E1, they were the 
maximum possible energy in this collider. But what I can do is I can decrease energy of one of the two beams. So instead of E1 and E1, now what we have is, well, E1 still here. And um, this particle will now be coming with some energy. Let me call it E2, less than E1. And the goal of changing this arrangement is to make it so that the particle that's being produced here, which will have some mass big M, um, different big M than this, but some mass M. But after being produced, I want this particle to be moving to the right with a speed 0.5 C. Yeah. So, um, so this would be the question that someone could ask. Well, um, so um, I'm sorry. This is the second setup, and uh, the two questions that someone could ask are B, what is value of E2? How much should this beam energy be reduced so that whatever resulting particle is, it's moving to the right? And the other question you could ask is, well, what is the mass of this particle now? Because it's going to be not the same as this. Do, does everyone see intuitively that this mass is not going to be the same as this? Like intuitively, how would you explain that? Is this mass smaller, greater, smaller? Smaller. smaller. OK, why is it smaller than this? Yeah, so it's smaller for two different reasons. One is the obvious one that E2 is decreasing. So there's smaller amount of energy to start out with. And the second thing is what Gaudio was referring to. In this final system, some of that energy has to go into kinetic energy. So this is just for the rest energy. So it's going to be smaller for two different separate reasons. So all right, so those are the questions. And the situation seems well specified enough, like you have all the details you should need. So how would you answer that? Let me change the situation a little bit and see if it will be easier to answer. So this is how I want to change the situation. So in this situation, it's not very easy because, um, well, um, because this particle is moving. You don't know its mass. You don't know how fast it will be moving, but you don't know its mass. That's, uh, I guess, the big thing. Um, so let me describe. Um, let me give you an alternate reference frame to describe this same exact picture in. In this alternate reference frame, this particle of mass m that gets produced, it's going to be at rest in this frame s prime. So well, this uh, one of the particles that's colliding, that's producing it, that will be coming in with some energy, E1 prime. I don't know what that is yet. Maybe I'll get to it. And this other particle that's coming in of mass m that's coming in with e2 prime. Now, in this reference frame, in this reference frame, frame as prime, do you know how e1 prime and e2 prime are related? How should they be related? Uh, you can write four vector. I'm looking for a simpler answer. Like there's something about E1 prime and E2 prime you know right from the beginning, from the specification that you are in the center of mass frame or center of momentum frame. When? They, should they should be equal to each other, right? In this reference frame, you can immediately say that E1 prime is equal to E2 prime. So that net momentum works out to be zero, and you get all that nice stuff before. So let me ask you this question. You already know what E1 is. That's a given. Do you have enough information to calculate E1 prime? Or let me put it differently. Do you know what uh, change of reference frame transformation 
relate to this reference frame, frame S, to this reference frame. What's the relative speed between them? Yeah, 0.5c, right? Because you imagine you are looking at this particle, moving at 0.5c relative to this frame, then this particle should be at rest. So, so this is the situation where you have a reference frame with the known boost parameter. You know how fast the frame should be moving. So once you have that, then you have this useful um, Lorentz transformation of energy and um, I guess I never wrote that momentum. So energy and momentum form four vector, which means they transform under Lorentz transformation like uh, coordinates do. So let me write it down. It, they transform this way. Um, so, so uh, let me use black pen. So given the energy and momentum in frame S, the energy and momentum in the primed frame that's moving to the right at some velocity v, it's given by this. E prime is equal to, um, let me write, E prime divided by C is equal to gamma E divided by C minus beta P, well, x technically, and uh, P x prime is gamma p x minus beta e over c. If you look, if you remember Lorentz transformation, this is um, taking the role of the time coordinate, and this is taking the role of space coordinate. Or in this case, I'm just writing down a space coordinate x, because um, y and z do nothing interesting. Okay? So this is your prescription for if you know the energy and momentum in one reference frame, how you get energy and momentum in the other reference frame. So here, um, um, so. Um, so here, this is the step that I'm going to walk, walk, uh, walk through. So I know the energy, which also means I kind of know the momentum. And uh, uh, because I know these two, I can um, plug those in to get what the energy E1, what the energy E1 prime is in the frame S, S prime frame. Then. In this easy reference frame, I can figure out what E2 prime should be. I can write down the momentum four vector uh, for the e, that corresponds to E2 prime. And I can do the reverse Lorentz transformation. And reverse Lorentz transformation is kind of easy. Um, so I guess you could do, al do algebra through this to figure it out. Or you can intuitively figure, well, Going from frame S to S prime is a frame moving to the right, right? Well, going from frame S prime to S is frame moving to the left. So wherever you see beta, you replace it with a minus beta. That gives you the reverse transformation that looks like, let me copy it down. E over C is equal to gamma E prime over C plus beta Px prime and Px is equal to gamma Px prime plus beta E prime over C. So once you figure out E2 prime, write down the energy momentum four vector, put it through the reverse transformation to get what E2 is. So that's the easy three steps to go through to find out what the energy E2 is. And along the way, you would also find out what M should be. Good. I, I think uh, um, I have 10 minutes. And I can do this in 10 minutes if I'm allowed to use something called ultra-relativistic approximation. 
This is an approximation that is correct with the numbers that are given in that exam, example. And this is the approximation that I'll be using so that I can work through this in the amount of time. Otherwise, the algebra gets a little bit long. So this is the approximation I'll be using. Approximation is that E1 and E2 are both much greater than mass m. As in, the total energy of the particle is much more than the rest energy, maybe 10 times more. That means factor gamma is about you know, 10 or more. And what that does is that makes it essentially so that the velocity of the particle, if I ever need it, is approximately c. And the second part, this is the more important part, I can say, so that's true, and I can say E1 is approximately P1C, because the mass is negligible. Okay. All right, so, so this is called ultra-relativistic approximation. Ultra-relativistic. And it's quite common in high energy particle physics where velocity of the particle is really very close to C, like 0 0.999 C or something. Yeah. All right, so let me proceed with that approximation. That'll make it easy enough for me to go through this. So let me write down the four vector that corresponds to E1. So that four uh, uh, energy momentum four vector would be this. Um, so E1, oh, I guess divided by C. And I guess the momentum is um, plus E1 over C also. Right? OK, so that's the energy momentum four vector. And um, this time, I'm going to write down the Lorentz transformation in the matrix form. In the matrix form, it looks like this. Multiplication by gamma minus gamma beta minus gamma beta gamma, right? So what I get here will be my E1 prime, P1 prime. So let me just work out E1 prime. So the uh, from here, E1 prime, oops, sorry, divide by C. So V1 prime divided by C is equal to gamma times that. So gamma, oh, um, and I guess I should uh, specify so that uh, it doesn't get confused. This gamma is the one associated with the 0 0.5 C. Right? Yes. So beta is actually, uh, I know the value of the beta. This is 0 0.5. Good. So um, let me uh, do I, uh, let me just keep gamma as is. So gamma sub 0 0.5. And this is a reminder. I know what the numerical value of this is. I can plug it in to figure out what this is later as soon as I want to. So gamma times E1 over C minus gamma 0 0.5. And this time, I'm just going to plug in beta. So beta would be just 0 0.5 times E1 over C. So I have a E1 over C on both sides. Let's factor it out. E1 over C times. And I have gamma minus gamma beta. Let me just uh, work out what the numerical factor of that is. And um, just plug that in. That'll be easier. So gamma with a beta of 0 0.5 would be 1 over square root of 1 minus 0 0.5 squared. That would be 1.155. So it's uh, 1.155 minus 1.155 times 0 0.5. So let me just plug in all the numbers so that things are easy for me. Oh, I guess I can do this. This times, well, 1 minus 0 0.5, which is 0 0.5. So E1 prime is E1 times, uh, so this is what you end up with. You get E1 prime is equal to 0 0.577 E1. Good. Then which tells you that, um, so this means that this is also equal to E2 prime. Okay. So let me write down the four vector 
that corresponds to this E2 prime, and then do the reverse Lorentz transformation to get the E2. So now, if you are thinking about this naively, you might think, wouldn't I just get the same E1 back? But the important thing is the direction of momentum is different. And that's going to make all the difference. Because in the reverse transformation, you are not going to get an increase in energy. You are going to get another decrease in energy. So let me write it out here. So this is my momentum for vector. Um, I guess, so this is, what this is supposed to be is E2 prime divided by C, P2 prime. And using this value to write it out, it's a 0 0.577 E1. And momentum, it's going to left, oops, divided by C. So it's minus 0 0.577 E1 over C. This is the E2 prime momentum for vector. Uh, the reverse transformation, it would be the same gamma and beta, but it will be gamma times plus gamma beta, because I'm plugging in minus beta in place of beta, plus gamma beta, gamma. So, and, uh, and the result you get here is going to be E2 over C and P2. All right, let's uh, figure out what this um, energy E2 is. Uh, let me use this space here to figure out that E2. So, um, E2 is equal to, um, so I have, uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to say I pre-multiplied it through C or let me not be unnecessarily confusing, okay. So E2 over C, I'm just writing out this uh, matrix element here. That's gamma times this. So gamma times um, 0 0.577 E1 over C plus, but oh, there's minus sign. So it's minus gamma times beta, which is 0 0.5 times um, 0 0.577 E1 over C. So uh, let me just uh, factor out some things. So factor out E1 over, or E1 over C times 0 0.577, which is in every one of these, times I have gamma times um, it's gamma times 0 0.5. I think I worked this out before, right? Gamma times 0 0.5, that was this. So the result you get is you just square this. So the value of E2 uh, from all of this, E2 is, um, I don't know, 0 0.55 squared. So. Uh, So E2 is equal to 0 point, uh, or one third E1. Yeah. So um, that's it. That's, uh, um, and you know, this is not an intuitive answer in any sense of the word. Like if you're looking at this, you wouldn't simply guess, yeah, to make this move to the right at half C, you reduce the energy to a third. You wouldn't say that, <laughs> like I couldn't get that. But the steps you work through is this. Um, so you realize that this situation is much easier to analyze in the center of mass frame. So you go to the center of mass frame and then figure out the energy in center of mass frame, or sorry, center of momentum frame. And then using that, using this center of momentum frame for momentum, you can transform it back to the frame S to get the energy in the lab frame that you want it. Now, if you want um, the mass, you can figure this out in the center of momentum frame. Because I guess what I'm figuring here, okay, so this must have been one over square root of three E1, right? So in the center of momentum frame, the total energy was two over square root of three E1. That's how much energy there was in this frame. And the center of momentum frame, all this is rest energy. 
So this mass here must be um, 2 over root third uh, e1 over c squared. And because this mass is a Lorentz invariant, you can calculate it in whatever reference frame it's convenient for you. It's more convenient for me to do it here, so I do it there. <laughs>